Hello, you've tuned in to the Benefit Broadcast, the Conceal or Reveal edition. I'm Laura Corriton and I founded a petition to end tampon tax in 2014 that changed UK law in 2021. I'm also an author and I run a social enterprise called Sex Ed Matters, giving sex ed workshops in schools. My name is Kenny Ethan Jones. I'm a writer, advocate and model, and I was the first man to front a video campaign. So first we're gonna throw it all back. Kenny, can you tell us a bit more about your first period experience? Oh God. All right, so I was 15. I had pretty much no idea what periods were. I'm mm. not gonna lie to you. Um, I attended an all-girls school at the time, and I remember being in class and like feeling this gushing feeling. I think it was like 20 minutes later, the same gushing feeling happened again. And honestly, a part of me was like, "Am I dying? Like, what's happening oh, right yeah. now?" Because it was such an unknown feeling. In the morning as well, like my stomach was hurting and all of those kind of things that happened. Mm. And so I went to the toilet and obviously, like, you know, dropped my trousers. I'm like, okay, what's <laughs> What's happening here? <laughs> because I'll be honest, like, although I went to an all-girls school and like society viewed me as a as a girl, I never felt that way. So as far as I was concerned, mm. I shouldn't be having a period. So when that happened, it was just like this moment of disassociation, essentially, mm. because I just couldn't understand what was happening. And I went home and I explained it to my mum, and I was like, Mum, I don't know what's happened. Like, there's blood in my underwear, basically. And my mum's face dropped, and not because like she knew this was going to happen, but to have that conversation with her son, when the messaging at that time was women and girls only have periods, mm. I feel like she knew how hard that conversation was going to be and that it was going to be this small moment of heartbreak for me. All right, it's time to check in with you all to see what you've been saying on social media. <whistles> Does it matter if my period is infrequent? Well, I don't, I don't believe periods are meant to be infrequent, mm -hmm. but like, you know, there's lots of things that can happen that could make your period infrequent, like being stressed, yeah, being pregnant. Your diet. Your diet, yeah. yeah. Oh my God, I, I didn't even think Changing about that. Diets. So yeah, there's, there's many reasons, but I think, yeah, if it's, if it's too infrequent mm -hmm. and you've missed a few periods, then it's kind of like a concern. And I would definitely go to my GP and just ask yeah. those kind of questions and see, see what they have to say. But I, I think it's always good to kind of like pay attention to your environment tracking and knowing how your period normally flows is very important and then yeah just yeah going back to your gp and having that conversation and just making that things making sure that everything's all clear perfect question for you can i donate period products who do they go to you can absolutely donate products you can do it through organizations like the red box project mm -hmm. um, which is started and founded by anna mills that's who's amazing um, or you can just donate them to your local food banks and mm -hmm. your local homeless shelters like hardly anybody donates those products to food banks or homeless shelters because it's just something we don't think about that much or maybe yeah. you feel embarrassed to be seen to like put them in there. Um, but most like supermarkets have like buckets for mm -hmm. uh, like big baskets for homeless shelters and, and that kind of thing in food banks. So yeah, absolutely. And then they'll go towards anyone who needs them. What challenges have you faced campaigning to end period stigma slash tampon tax? Um, I think the biggest challenge, at least at the beginning, was just like getting people to talk about it um, in terms of like politicians didn't want to know. So, for example, my local MP, won't name him, but cis man, just to give perspective. And um, I'd emailed him about it when I first started the petition and he replied three months later, literally like a letter through the door mm -hmm. um, saying he basically doesn't care and it's like not his issue. Um, and he like can't help basically. But it wasn't until we got like 100,000 signatures that they started to take note. How can we be more inclusive of the range of people with periods? Oh, it's <laughs> such a big question when you There's think about so it. There's so much to say, I'm sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, there is. The first thing that comes to mind is obviously inclusive language. Yeah. Like that's kind of the first thing that, like benchmark that I feel like everyone should be doing at this point. Because yep. it's an actual fact that not just women experience periods. Let's just be honest. Yep. And so that's kind of the first thing that I see it as. The second thing is around um, imagery, marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of companies, for instance, will use gender inclusive language, but will never have a trans or non-binary model model one of their products. And mm -hmm. so it kind of becomes problematic in the sense that you're only being inclusive, essentially sometimes because the fear of being canceled. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're using a gender inclusive language so that you don't get canceled, but actually you're not really here for trans people and trans inclusion. You're literally just scared of that. It's like tokenism kind of. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, that's one of the things that comes to mind. Also, this is one of the things I've been thinking about recently, right? So, for instance, like with the surge of uh, period underwear becoming more of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're more sustainable uh, and they're just a better product. 
what I found is that lots of companies took a product that was made for women and remarketed it and repurposed it as a product for trans men and non-binary people. Okay. Right? But listen, hear me out. Okay. Okay, so period underwear are built and based on women's bodies, right? Yep. And so when I think about like boy shorts, for instance, is, is, is the period, that's the period underwear that is like marketed towards trans men and non-binary people. But the one thing that makes me feel more dysphoric than anything else is my hips. Mm. But when you wear boy shorts, for instance, they're shaped to emphasize hips. Mm. And so actually you haven't, you, you, mm. you can kind of make us feel more dysphoric because you actually haven't created a product for us. You've just repurposed it. I would love to see more companies actually make products specifically for trans men and non-binary people. What do you think um, people can do who are like allies who want to like support the movement? That's hard because... Um, I guess the same in a way, like look yeah. out for brands that are inclusive in meaningful ways yeah. and like who's innovating the sector in this more inclusive way um, and like listening, being a part of the conversation that they want to be a part of. But sometimes it can be really tricky when I had this radio interview, mm. was using inclusive language and then got all this backlash from people who thought I was an idiot for not, mm. for thinking that it's not just women who have periods, even though that's a fact. For them, it's like, it's a fact that that's, it's like yeah. the opposite is a fact. Well, that's the thing. That's when you check, you know, you speak to someone who's trans. Yeah. And you say, is my opinion right in this situation? Do you mm. know what I mean? Because, yeah, that's the best way to do it. Like, you need to speak to the people who it's going to affect. Yes. One of the things that I feel like you're an expert on is like period poverty and how like campaigning is different in different places. And I would just like to know, like, start wherever you want to go. But I just, I just want to hear more about that. Yeah, sounds great. So um, Period Poverty Festival, there's so many activists that are working in the space, like Amica George, for example. Um, so yeah, there's loads out there, but it's basically a combination of two things. So the first thing is like poverty. So people who can't afford period products are obviously impacted by period poverty. But there's a much wider like group of people and that is just anyone impacted really by period stigma. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a survey done by uh, Plan UK that found that 75% of people who have periods, they haven't bought period products when they need them because they're embarrassed to be seen in the period aisle in the supermarkets. And That's a high percentage. It's so high. Mm -hmm. And I think I have done that previously, like that when person. I was at school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so those people will be impacted by period poverty because it essentially just means like being without the products that you need when you need them. So you spoke about your experience in school. Mm. So I wanted to ask, like, how has this changed over time? And yeah, how have you dealt with that emotionally as well as anything else? Okay, so 15 year old, first period, regular period, mm -hmm. as I call them, my pre-T periods. Okay. Um, so I had a regular period for about two years and I started hormone blockers, uh, which completely stopped my periods. And that was this kind of, I don't know, first time I felt like I could breathe because I was so stressed and disassociated and like it was making my gender dysphoria worse like I wasn't looking in mirrors at this time and all of that was just becoming heightened from having periods so I was like so happy when the period stopped I was like yes yeah. <laughs> so they stopped um I started testosterone a year later um there's kind of like this period when you start uh testosterone where you might have slight bleeding like spotting um which is which is very normal mm -hmm. um they told me that that would happen and it did and I was like okay like this isn't the nicest thing it's not necessarily what, what I want to experience, but I was always thinking about the end goal. And the end goal was to have a beard, masculine chest, deep voice, ticked all the boxes, great time. <laughs> so yeah, five years on testosterone, randomly had a period, like full blown, like kind of my same periods I had pre-testosterone. And I don't know, like it's weird because in that moment, I felt so taken back to the person I was mm -hmm. when I first had my first period that many, many moons ago. And I felt lost. I felt scared. Um, it, it, it's so hard to describe something that basically makes you feel like your life is falling apart. And so obviously I was really concerned and I went to my doctor and asked like, what's happening? And the thing is, because trans bodies are just so under-researched and understudied, they didn't really understand what was happening. And all they could do is check my blood to make sure that my testosterone levels were where they were supposed to be. And they was. And so they were just like, well, hopefully it doesn't happen again. I was like, but what? That's not what you want, is it? it? But what if you it does? Yeah, yeah, like what? why has it happened yeah you know and there was no explanation and i think you get more frustrated in the fact that there was no explanation mm. and i had to give myself closure on that and just kind of go trans bodies are understudied and under research how can i expect these people to know trans people are one percent of the population I, and i'm just gonna have to accept that this is the case um and move forward and so i tried to and it's like happening again mm. and again and again but not as bad like more kind of infrequent um and now i like to 
I call, I have what I'd like to call an internal cycle. So I have all of the kind of emotions and the feelings of periods and like the cramps, but I have no physical bleeding. What have you learned from this conversation? What comes next? The biggest thing I've learned, I think, is just like listening to other people. And I mean, I thought I knew a lot about periods, but listening to you, I've learned so much. And I think you're right. It's just seeing that human experience and listening to your story come like so authentically has just made me yeah, think a lot more about periods and a lot more depth.